Welcome, brave souls, to the chilling depths of horror and detail. The realm where the shadows whisper ancient secrets and nightmares come to life. I am your guide through the darkness, and on this channel, we delve into the spine-chilling world of Wendigo horror stories that will send shivers down your spine. First story, Wendigo. I love the woods. I love mountains. Being able to live so close to nature is a privilege I've never taken for granted. But recently, something strange happened out there that I'd like to share. I was heading down a path in the woods, not far from my home. It had been snowing heavily for the past couple weeks and was finally starting to calm down. In the distance, I noticed what appeared to be a man, leaning against a log. Far from the trail, he was still. I feared maybe he had been stuck out here and frozen in that spot. It's all too common out here when the snowfall is heavy. I made my way over to him. As I got close, I could see his ears and fingers were frostbitten. His clothes were dirty and disheveled. His mouth was covered in dried blood. When I was only a few steps from him, his head began to move, slowly turning and looking at me with dead, glazed over eyes. His expression was vacant until he looked at me with surprise and a crazed sort of fear. He tried to stumble to his feet, but instead ended up flailing into the deep snow. I talked softly and slowly. Do you need help? How long have you been out here? The man wouldn't, or perhaps couldn't, speak. However, nearby was a small hiking backpack with a tag on it that listed an address. I knew where the address was, just a few miles from my home. He must be a neighbor. I tried asking him if that was where he lived. He just kept looking at me with that crazed, fear-drenched stare. But eventually he was able to nod in affirmation. I had no way of contacting anyone, so I figured my best option would be to take him myself. Who knew how much longer he'd last out there if I left to get help. I picked him up to stand on his feet, and he was remarkably light. He leaned on my shoulder at first, but after walking for a short time, he walked almost entirely on his own. He began to say things, as if he was talking to himself. A low, dry, gurgling sort of speech. It felt very inhuman. He must be delusional, I thought. I try to get him to talk to me. How long have you been out here? Weeks. His voice was like gravel. I'm taking you home. Is there someone that can help you? My wife. You were out here all alone? He stopped talking. After a short time he stopped walking and fell to his knees. He began to weep and I tried to stand him up again. He latched onto me and whispered closely. I dash... I had to eat. That explained the dried blood on his mouth. When you're in a life or death situation, you have to make hard decisions. I stopped talking after that. It took us a while of trudging to make it to his home. As we approached the front door, it swung open and out ran a woman whom I assumed was his wife. Oh my God. Honey, is that you? She shouted as she ran up and grabbed him all but ignoring me. She hurried him inside, saying she'd call for a doctor, leaving me in the cold. That's fine. It's probably a lot to take in, to have your husband disappear for weeks and show up out of the blue like that. I had to get home to my wife anyway. She's probably wondering where I was. On my way home, I was going over everything that had happened. What if I hadn't found him? Will he tell his wife what happened? Where was the other person that was with him? Next thing I remember, I was doubling over in pain. It came from the bottom of my stomach. Oh no, I thought. I could have just infected myself with something he had. I blacked out and woke up at home in bed. No idea how I got there. An hour or so went by. I laid in bed staring at the ceiling, feeling a pit in my stomach. The pain was immense. It was almost like a severe hunger. I thought for sure I had contracted something from the man I helped earlier. 
some airborne illness. When the doctor came, he approached my bedside with caution. He had almost no professional candor. His eyes widened as he looked at me with a certain fear. He only did a few tests and left me to be quarantined in my room alone. I could hear him speaking to my wife in the kitchen. When? He goes. I couldn't make out much of the conversation. Seemed like bad news. After the doctor left, my pain only got worse. It was more distinctive hunger, however. I was becoming delirious. I couldn't remember the last time I ate. I have eaten before, haven't I? My wife came to me asking what I needed. My only answer was, meat. It's been a week now since I got sick. I've lost so much weight. I'm a ghost of my former self, but I eat constantly. Venison and beef, most commonly. My hunger is so strong I'll eat them raw. When I was at my weakest my wife fed me, and I almost bit her fingers off a few times. Not that I mean to. I'm just starving. She's opted to start sliding food under my door. She says I'm not the same anymore. I know that much. The dog went missing and only I know why. The doctor has come a few times again, saying the same things to my wife. However, I don't think he's saying, when he goes, it's something more like, Wendigo. A Wendigo is a demon. They'll take over your body and slowly kill you. They say Wendigos do awful things to you. Killing people and consuming their flesh. Soon I'll die. I can feel it. Whatever has happened to me will be the end of this body. Then I'll have to go. But what can I say? At least you got this far. I helped you out of there. You never would have survived without me. I just needed this body. It's been such a long time. Out there in the woods. I love the woods. I love the mountains. Second story. My apartment is haunted and I have proof. About a year ago, my boyfriend and I moved away from the hustle and bustle of apartment living in the city and decided to rent outside of town. We searched for weeks for the perfect place when we finally came across a small two-bedroom apartment on the outskirts of town. The old house, the apartment building itself, is located at the end of a dead-end road which backs out onto woodland. For us, it was exactly what we were looking for. It had privacy, few neighbors, large yard, storage, etc. We couldn't have asked for a better place, however, that seems to have come at a price. Upon our first time entering the apartment, we fell in love. The landlord stood in the kitchen as my boyfriend, and I moved through the rest of the unit, quietly discussing what we liked about it and how we would place our furniture. Once we finally made our way back to the kitchen, Carla, the landlord, nervously asked how we liked it, to which we expressed our love for it. She let out a deep sigh of relief and confessed that she had had a lot of trouble trying to rent out the unit over the last few years, despite having no problem with the rest of the units. She said people often came and went from the apartment within the first few months of being there. You would think that at this point I would have stopped and asked why no one was sticking around, however. I was so enthralled with the thought of living there that the notion of concern was pushed to the back of my mind. It then slipped even further in the back of my mind when she mentioned lowering our rent if we were willing to sign a lease right then and there. Not wanting to pass up a great opportunity and facing homelessness in less than two weeks, we were eager to sign. It wasn't until weird things started happening in the apartment that my previous concern returned. The old tenant. Two months after we moved in, I decided to sell something online and arranged for the item to be picked up at my apartment rather than meeting someplace. The woman, to my surprise, knew exactly where my apartment was located and met me after work one day. I greeted her at the front door of the building and guided her upstairs into my apartment, where she started to chit-chat about how beautiful of a day it was. Did you have a hard time finding the place? I said, changing the subject. You seem to know exactly where I was. No. It's kind of funny actually.
My brother used to live in your apartment. She looked around the apartment with a smile. It's a lot nicer than when he lived here, that's for sure. Well, isn't that a coincidence? I said, feeling a little awkward. Do you happen to know why he left? The landlord said people come and go all the time. Is it the neighbors? I asked, handing her the item she came for. I thought about the tenants that I had met thus far, and although they seemed like friendly people, the landlord warned that they weren't very fond of younger folk. The woman who stood in front of me looked no older than 25, which led me to assume that her brother must be around the same age. He never mentioned anything like that, she said hesitantly. I think he was lonely and hated the solitude, to be honest. He wasn't himself when he was here. She shrugged, and then handed me some money for our exchange. Although I wanted to continue to pry, I simply took the money and thanked her for making her way out here. As I walked her back down to the entrance of the apartment, she turned back, her hand lingering on the knob. Take care of yourself, okay? A frown was strewn across her face as she spoke. The once bright light of sunshine that she seemed to radiate around her was now gone. Before I had the chance to respond, she walked out of the building without another word. The air in the stairway felt heavy as I stood there, confused. I thought back to our conversation, which seemed innocent enough, but something about the way she looked at me before she left had me feeling off. It felt like a warning of some sort, but I couldn't be sure. It left me thinking that maybe there was something else that made her brother leave. The Shadow People, Part 1 The first time it happened was on a hot Saturday night a few weeks after my weird encounter with the previous tenant's sister. I was woken up in the middle of the night by my boyfriend, James, who was getting up to have his nightly midnight snack. I rolled over, facing the door and watched James leave the room to make his way to the kitchen. I rolled back over facing the wall, listening to James rummage through the fridge and after about a minute, I thought I heard James walking back towards the room. I looked over my shoulder and watched as a black silhouette entered the room. Thinking it was James, I laid my head back on my pillow and closed my eyes, feeling someone get into bed next to me. No more than two seconds later, I heard the fridge door close and my body stiffened in fear. I slowly brought my hand out from under my blanket and reached next to me surprised and also horrified to feel that no one was beside me. I propped myself on my elbow, turning to look next to me just as James entered the room. Only this time, I noticed that I could see James' facial features from the moonlight pouring in from our bedroom window unlike the dark silhouette that walked in before him. Did you not just come to bed? I asked as he closed the door behind him. What do you mean? He said confused, placing his cup on the bedside table and getting in bed next to me. Like a minute ago I saw you walk in and felt you get in bed with me. He laughed as I spoke. Are you sure you weren't dreaming? He said, wrapping his arm around me tightly. James fell asleep almost instantly. Meanwhile, I laid awake thinking of the faceless silhouette that seemed to have joined me in bed. By the time I had fallen back asleep, however, I had adequately convinced myself that James was right after all. I had just been dreaming. Well, that was until the silhouette made another appearance. A month or so had passed and truthfully, I was still hung up on the silhouette. Although I kept trying to convince myself that it wasn't real, the haunting reality was that it was real, and my second sighting confirmed this. I had woken up sometime in the night needing to use the bathroom. I groggily got out of bed and just barely opened the bedroom door before I found myself frozen in fear. In my peripheral vision, I could see a black figure. Only this time the silhouette wasn't just standing there. It was atop the kitchen cupboards, laying flat with its long fingers hanging over the edge of the cupboard. I closed my eyes as tight as I could and mentally counted to three trying to build the courage to look at the figure head-on. 
But once I opened my eyes and looked in that direction, the silhouette was no longer there. My heart was beating a mile per minute as I slowly crept into the kitchen, thinking that maybe I was just seeing shadows of things on top of the cupboards. I turned on the light, and a mixture of relief and fear washed over me as I saw that it was completely empty. I remember verbally saying, it's the just the cat, knowing that if I debunked it with something plausible, I could go on with the rest of my night somewhat unbothered. It was also better than the alternative of waking James, just to be told that I was seeing things. I stood in the kitchen for about another minute before the urge to use the bathroom reminded me why I was awake in the first place. I did my business and headed back towards the bedroom, when just as I was about to cross the threshold into our bedroom, I could see the silhouette in the corner of my eye once more, standing upright in the corner of the living room. This time... I took a deep breath, walked into the bedroom, completely ignoring the silhouette, and retreated to the comfort of James' arms. They say ignorance is bliss, right? The office. The first time I'd walked into the second bedroom of the apartment after we got the place, I knew I didn't want it as our main bedroom. Something in the back of my mind was telling me not to. So when James showed interest in using it as an office-slash-storage room, I let him take it. It wasn't until after we had settled in that I found myself avoiding going into that room entirely and would often close the door when James wasn't home. Being in that room alone made me feel uneasy, and even walking past it would make the hairs on the back of my neck stand. At first, I brushed it off as it being a new place and having to get used to it, but I changed my mind the day we set up a TV in there. James and I had just come home from my grandmother's, who had gifted us my grandfather's TV. My grandfather died two months prior to this and used this TV up until the day he passed. James, who was very excited to have a TV in his office slash man cave, set it up the moment we got home and began watching Netflix. A couple hours passed before he called me into the office. Just sit down and wait, he said pulling out the chair next to him. I sat there and waited for no more than a few seconds when the input drop-down menu popped up on the screen and then disappeared. Then, a few moments later, the volume went up from 12 to 30. Stop then went from 30 to 100 gradually within the next minute. Are you screwing around with the remote? I asked, thinking that James was trying to pull a prank of some sort. No, it's doing it on its own. I've tried everything. He shrugged. Weird, right? My first initial reaction was to get in on video. So that's what I did. Video 1, video 2. Also pardon my language, LMAO. After I had gotten evidence of what was happening, I asked James if I could tell him something that I'd been keeping from him. I assured him it wasn't anything to really worry about, that it was something regarding the apartment. He looked at me with a worried expression as I let out a deep breath. This is going to sound dumb, but I think the house is haunted. I didn't want to say anything because it sounds so stupid, but I genuinely think it's real. I said, feeling incredibly embarrassed. You too? He sighed. I thought it was just me, he exclaimed. He then went on to tell me that since we had moved in, he was closing the kitchen cupboards almost daily, thinking I had left them open. He said he only resorted to thinking our apartment was haunted when I called him out for leaving the cupboards open one morning when he thought they had been left open by me the night prior. Not wanting to freak me out, he didn't say anything and figured he would tell me when things escalated. Though he didn't know that things had already escalated with me at this point. I ended up describing my two encounters with the silhouette and how his dismissal the first time made me reluctant to tell him what was going on. He looked confused and then said that he didn't remember having that conversation with me and that he often didn't remember waking up in the middle of the night unless I told him about it the next morning. That day in the office, we made a pact that we would only talk about the haunting when we weren't inside the apartment. 
The last thing we want to do is to anger or bother whatever paranormal entity is living with us. The Shadow People, Part 2 I want to say that for the better part of four months, our apartment was utterly lackluster. It seemed that now that we were both on the lookout, the haunting stopped. Or maybe it was just waiting for us to think it stopped. One Saturday night, James and I had stayed up late watching YouTube videos. We were midway through a video when I decided that I was too tired to stay up any longer and told James that I was going to go to bed. Not being tired enough yet, James said that he was going to finish the video and would join me in bed later. No more than 20 minutes after I had gone to bed, James came running into the bedroom, waking me in the process. His breathing was erratic as he crawled into bed beside me, holding me tightly. Not sure how to react to my boyfriend retreating in fear, I asked him what happened and if he was okay. He responded with a simple no and then whispered, I just saw the black figure. Knowing we had our pact, I told him to tell me about it the following morning when we were out and about, and so he did. James said that once I left to go to bed, he went on to continue watching his video when he thought he saw something in the corner of his eye near the bathroom. Now, to better understand, it's important to note that from where James sits on the couch in the living room, if the door to the bathroom is open, you can see right into it from across the apartment. Thinking that he might have seen one of our cats, he brushed it off and continued with his video. A few moments later, he said he felt weird, like someone was watching him, and decided to get up and turn on the light in the bathroom. By doing so, this gave him some peace of mind, and the feeling of being watched eventually went away. 10 to 15 minutes later, he said that all of a sudden something caught his eye again. He said that in his peripheral vision, he could see a black silhouette walk into the bathroom. At first, he thought that I had gone to the bathroom, so he called out for me but quickly realized as he glanced into the bathroom that no one was there. Since that night, neither James nor I have seen the silhouette. Google Home. Not too long ago, Spotify Canada had a promotion for a free Google Home Mini if you signed up for Spotify Premium. I already had the premium membership so when I heard about the giveaway, I was excited and went on to get one. We thought this was an excellent idea for our bathroom as we like to listen to music in the shower. Little did we know it would have a more sinister purpose. May 9, 2019 It was late in the evening one night. James and I were watching TV when all of a sudden, we heard the Google Home go off in the bathroom. We thought this was weird as we have never heard it go off by itself. At first, James was convinced that it just heard the TV because it was loud, but I wasn't so sure, so I decided to check the activity lock. Well, color me shocked when I see that the command it responded to was ordinary man. Feeling kind of creeped out and not wanting to get ahead of myself, I asked James if he could rewind the video about five minutes back. James, oblivious to why I was asking, obliged and rewound the video back to what we had been watching just before the Google Home went off. I listened for the words, ordinary man, or something similar, but nothing ever came up. Now justifiably freaked out, I mentioned to James what the log said, and he looked at me with a worried expression. This then got me thinking, how many times had the Google Home gone off without us noticing? I scrolled through the logs, horrified to see that the Google Home registered six unknown voice commands, four of which were on days that we were either not home because of work slash going out or sleeping as we go to bed around 10.30 to 11 p.m. The other two are up in the air as we don't know what we were doing at those times. After that night, James was adamant on keeping the Google Home unplugged until we wanted to use it but I had another idea. I told him that I wanted to keep it plugged in, but that I would monitor the logs more regularly. Well, I did. And since then it has registered two more unknown voice commands, both of which we were not home for, with the latest one being registered on June 2nd. Since then, I have left the Google Home unplugged.
Here are all the logs. To be honest, I don't know where to go from here. As of right now, James and I are kind of hoping that if we continue to be ignorant about the situation, it'll just go away. But deep down, I know it won't. I've heard that things like this get increasingly worse as time passes and honestly, I don't think I can deal with more. Last night, I had trouble falling asleep because around 11 p.m., the dog started growling at the foot of our bed. James said that she was probably just having a nightmare, but something in the back of my mind told me otherwise. I really don't want this to keep progressing, but I'm not sure how to do that as moving is not on the table as of right now. I'll take any advice at this point. Third story. Why I stay away from haunted houses. I still remember how the screen door slammed that October evening. My foster father's voice, however, was even louder as he shouted after me. Just where the hell do you boys think you're going? I gestured over my shoulder at my friend Brett's car, idling at the end of the gravel driveway. I was going to a haunted house with some friends from school. I explained over the rumble of the motor. Over my dead body. Frank yelled. Get back up here. I couldn't understand what I'd done to make Frank Liddell so angry. He and my foster Missouri, Pam, were a little rough around the edges, but they weren't the exploiters or religious nutjobs that I'd feared when I was first put into foster care. They'd been nothing but kind to me so far, although the look on my foster father's face suggested that was all about to change. I wasn't scared of Frank Liddell, but I was afraid of what might happen if my new family rejected me. Giving up a haunted house seemed like a small price to pay to avoid the other kind of foster home. I shook my head at Brett. He rolled his eyes and drove off in a cloud of exhaust fumes, taking my hopes of fitting in at my new school with him. From now on, I'd be known as the loser who didn't celebrate Halloween. I dragged my feet on the way back to the porch, but all my irritation disappeared when I saw my foster father up close. He'd fallen, rather than sat, on the rocking chair beside the door. He was watching me with the shell-shocked pale expression of a man who just narrowly avoided a gruesome accident. You ever been to one of those things before? He asked. A haunted house, I mean? I shook my head. That was part of the reason why I was so eager to go. They got all kinds now. Ones with mechanical monsters. Ones where people in masks can jump out and grab you. At some of them, you gotta sign a waiver, saying they're not responsible for whatever they do to you. You really sure you want to go to a place like that? I hadn't thought about it, but I doubted that the local spooky attractions in the small town where the Liddells lived was known for over-the-top horror. In fact, the bright orange flyer I'd found had said that the place was kid-friendly. Frank rambled on. Course, most places just put out those warnings for show. If they ever really did hurt anybody, they'd be out of business overnight. Provided that they were ever really in business to begin with. I mean, you never really know for sure who those masked figures are, do you? The ones who you've given permission to come out of the dark, touch you. Maybe even drag you off someplace sure. It might just be an underpaid actor in a plastic costume. But can you really be sure? I'd heard rumors like that before. Campfire stories about serial killers in costumes who snuck into Halloween attractions to hunt their victims. I'd never paid them much attention, but the look on Frank's face made me reconsider. I'm not just talking about a couple psychopaths here. What I want you to think about is this. Why do haunted houses exist? I shrugged. I didn't know where this bizarre conversation was going, and at this point, I wasn't sure I wanted to find out. But Frank wasn't done. Don't think I can't see the appeal. Of course getting scared is sort of fun. If afterwards you walk back out into the sane, ordinary world you left behind. But what if you don't? What if it's the houses that want people to go inside, and not the other way around? I took a deep breath. So my foster father thought that buildings can have personalities. 
There were worse kinds of crazy to be. I reminded myself and looked wistfully down the country road where the fumes of Brett Scar still lingered. This was my life now, and I'd have to make the best of it. I muttered an apology and moved toward the door, telling myself that I should count my blessings. But Frank's hand wrapped around my wrist like a claw. Look, I'm willing to bet that nothing would have happened if you boys had gone to the haunted house in town tonight. People visit haunted houses all the time, right? Nothing happens to them. Well, most of them. But if it did, would anyone notice the pattern? Think about it. If a cop or university professor suggested researching haunted house disappearances, they'd be laughed out of a job. So people look away, and it keeps happening. Frank drank a swig of water like a man throwing back a shot, and for the first time I wondered whether the water that he always carried with him was really a substitute for a different sort of bottle. Halloween wasn't always the big flashy holiday that it is today. When I was your age, we had a few hay bales and pumpkins in front of the town hall, some cardboard witches in the windows of the elementary school, and that was about it. If you wanted something fancy, like a rubber mask or a costume party, you had to go to the big city. Frank sighed. I shouldn't have yelled at you. But when I saw your buddy pull up in his car, I thought back to the Halloween night when my two best friends and I took that drive and went to our first haunted house. Cassie and Tyler didn't have many friends. I didn't either. That might have been the only thing the three of us had in common, but it was enough. See, Cassie's dad never did nothing but drink and cause trouble, and most folks figured that the apple didn't fall from the tree. Tyler, on the other hand, Frank blushed. Well, the only thing people had against him was that the color of his mama's skin was different from his daddy's. The two of them had been dating for years, which is about as serious as it gets in high school. When they adopted me into the little group, I don't know why. Hell, maybe they were just bored. Either way, with Tyler and Cassie I finally started doing the sort of things I'd always imagined teenagers did. Smoking in the park, walking down railroad tracks, swimming in the river in summer, and having plans for Halloween night. That's the worst part. The part that still stings. The haunted house was my idea. We had it all planned out. Tyler's mom was the editor for some magazine, and a grateful author had sent her some expensive liquor as a thank you gift. Tyler would steal the bottle and give it to Cassie, who would leave it out for her dad after school. By 6 p.m. he'd be blackout drunk, and Cassie would snatch his keys and pick us up on the way out of town. We'd go to the city, where we'd trick or treat like little kids, visit a haunted house, try to sneak into some college parties. With the full moon rising and that fall wind in our hair, it felt like anything could happen. We had it all planned out. Frank repeated and shook his head. After buying some silly discount masks and gorging ourselves on candy bars from the rich neighborhoods, we headed for the haunted house. We hadn't kept track of time, and Cassie was afraid we wouldn't get there before close, not to mention the line. None of us were used to the city, and just finding a place to park among all those cars was a nightmare. It felt like the house with its creepy lighting effects and soundtrack of evil laughter, was teasing us. Cassie left the car in front of a fire hydrant, and we took off down the sidewalk, hoping we weren't too late. The ticket guy was a kid our age in zombie face paint, in an oversized pinstripe purple suit. He told us that the house closed at half an hour before midnight, and we were three minutes too late. All he wanted to do was finish cleaning up and go home, but I guess the look on our faces made him change his mind. He sighed, took our money, and pulled back the red velvet rope in front of the front porch stairs. The place had probably been some rich farmer's estate, once. Now it was gray, gaunt, and rickety. There was something hungry about the way it loomed over us as we walked inside. The double doors creaked open automatically, a nice touch, I thought. 
and we stepped into a hallway lit only by creepy blue bulbs. Tyler made a joke about what shows up in blacklight. We all jumped a little and laughed when the doors slammed shut behind us. It must have been a pretty fancy house in its day, but the hallway Tyler, Cassie and I walked down was bare except for plastic skeletons and fake cobwebs. It had a sad, barren look to it, like whoever had set up the haunted house didn't have the budget to decorate it the way that it deserved. Halloween-themed songs played from a speaker somewhere, and candles flickered in a couple jack-o'-lanterns, but that was about it. The three of us were pretty disappointed. We'd expected movie-quality effects, not cheap junk that we could have bought at the dollar store back in town. We'd almost reached the staircase at the far end of the hallway when a laughing woman with a rope around her neck fell from the ceiling. The rope brought her to a halt just above our heads, and we all screamed. Up close, it was clear that we were just looking at a mannequin dressed up like a witch, but that wasn't what had startled me. See, I would have sworn that what I saw was Cassie, eyeless and bone thin, like she'd been falling so long she'd starve to death. Tyler gave the mannequin a shove and chuckled as it swung on its rope. Cassie shushed him. It didn't seem right, disturbing the silence like that. The echoes were all distorted, like the hallway was somehow bigger than it looked. I put my foot on the first step of the staircase and everything went black. Suddenly I was falling. Not down these steps but different ones. Stairs so steep I could feel the wind around me as I tumbled through the dark. When I looked up, Cassie had caught me. There were no twisted stairs here. Just the dim lobby of a cheap haunted house. I told the other two that I'd race them to the second floor. We were panting by the time we got to the top even though it couldn't have taken that long. The theme up there was classic monsters. A mummy that popped out of a broom closet, rubber bats bouncing from the ceiling, a mechanical zombie that sat up from its coffin as we passed by. Nothing scary enough to even make us look twice. Nothing like what had happened to me on those stairs. An arrow painted in fake blood directed us to a door on the left and Tyler yanked the door open impatiently. We were bored already, eager to be done with this and worried about the car. But what we saw behind that door stopped us in our tracks. It was just an ordinary living room. No de queraschens, no cheesy themes. Just a gramophone, some armchairs, a ticking wall clock in the shape of a cat with big eyes that swung from side to side. It was a near-perfect replica of how must have people lived almost a century ago, except that it looked brand new. There was even a cigar burning in an ashtray and a half-finished glass of brandy, like whoever was living here would be back any minute. It felt obscene, like we were invading somebody's privacy and trespassing somewhere we shouldn't. I was about to suggest that we turn back when the door slammed and locked behind us. I knew we had to cross that eerie room to leave it, but even so, it was hard to take that first step. The tiny pink flowers on the hideous wallpaper seemed to squirm like tiny fingers, and I had an awful feeling that we were being watched from the far corner of the room. Suddenly, the gramophone started playing by itself but the noise coming out of it wasn't music. It was us, Tyler and Cassie and I, screaming, arguing, shouting in terror about bruises and grabbing hands. We'd never spoken those words in our lives. The three of us looked at each other and all had the same thought. Get out of here as quickly as possible. The gramophone kept getting louder and louder. I thought my ears would bleed before we got to the door on the other side of the room, but once we were through it, the noise stopped completely, and all the lights went out. We closed the door behind us and leaned against it, too scared to talk. Tyler started to say something about how maybe it was all part of the act, but the words died in his throat, especially after he looked around at where we were. It was a dim, dirty kitchen. If the room we'd left had been something out of the last century, 
This one was all 1970s. Dark wood cupboards, pea green walls, puke yellow linoleum. The only thing the two had in common was the inescapable, lingering feeling that we weren't supposed to be there. Like something was leading us into its trap, hunting us. Once, when I was a kid, the basketball I was playing with rolled under a neighbor's porch. I crawled in after it without thinking, and as I was feeling around in the dank, cobwebby dark, something growled behind me. I never found out what it was a stray dog, a mountain lion, or maybe even just a rabid raccoon. But I never felt that kind of fear again until I stepped into that nasty little kitchen, like I'd gotten myself trapped in a cramped place with something hungry and horrible. There were no windows and only one door. We had no choice but to keep going deeper into the house, if that's what it was. There was something wrong about the air in there. It seemed to be moving, and it wasn't until we approached the dripping faucet that I realized what it was. The air was buzzing with thousands of tiny flies. Cassie clamped a hand over her mouth and leaned over the sink to see what they were coming from. Then she groaned and bolted for the door. Tyler followed her. Slipping in a puddle of something rust-colored and sticky that was coming from the fridge, and I followed. Our footsteps had woken the place up somehow. There was a bang from inside the cabinets, then another, so hard that they shook, and I realized that I absolutely could not handle seeing whatever was about to come out of there. We shoved each other through the door just in time, and felt the slam when something crashed into it behind us. More came, hard enough to rattle the door on its hinges, but it held. We were in what looked like a children's nursery. Bright, wide-smiling zoo animals painted on the walls. Small bed topped with plain white sheets. A night light in the shape of a grinning plastic moon. It was dead silent, like the room was waiting for us. Then, all at once, for almost human shapes sat up beneath the covers. We froze, too scared to move, then something reached out from beneath the bed and tried to pull me under. I yelped in pain, kicked it off, and ran. Once the door was pressed shut behind us, I rolled up the cuff of my jeans and found a burn mark in the shape of a tiny hand with too many fingers. It was still painfully cold to the touch. Cassie started yelling, demanding to be let out, shouting that we'd never agreed to let anyone touch us, but she stopped mid-sentence. It was the same argument that we'd heard on the gramophone when we first walked into this nightmare. The realization shocked us into silence, and we finally began to take in our surroundings. We were in another hallway, but this one didn't have an end. The ugly yellow wallpaper and old-fashioned doors went on forever in both directions. Just looking at it made me want to grab onto the floor, like at any minute the hallway would tilt and I'd slide down the carpet into the abyss. I was still trying to get my head around it when the doorknob of the room we'd left began to turn. There was rustling on the other side. Fingers feeling around the gaps and hinges. Tyler started pulling on one doorknob after another. But they were all locked. At the pace he was moving, we struggled to keep up with him. He started knocking instead swearing that he could hear movement and voices on the other side of the doors. He yelled and pleaded, begging to be let in. Then, when Cassie and I were too far away to help him, he got his wish. The door in front of Tyler swung open, and I saw the terror on his face for just a split second before he was sucked inside. The door shut and locked itself behind him, but Cassie and I weren't going to let that stop us. I kicked the door until my foot went through it, and then I howled in pain. There was nothing but a wall on the other side. It was like the house had swallowed Tyler up. Even worse, we had no idea where we were. The doors were all identical, and none of us had thought to mark the point that we'd started from. Cassie just shut down, holding her head in her hands and muttering about how this couldn't be happening. I remember thinking that at this rate, it wouldn't be long before both of us went crazy, 
and maybe that was the point. Then I heard hinges creaking. By the time I spun around, the door was wide open. There was nothing but darkness on the other side. At least that's what I thought at first. Once I got closer, though, I saw the stairs. Narrow, uneven, with a plunge into the blackness on either side. And no guardrail. I ever mention that I'm scared of heights? I couldn't do it. I told Cassie that I'd starve to death in the endless hallway before I'd make myself climb down there, but she wouldn't take no for an answer. Through a mix of pleading, insults, and holding my hand, she finally got me moving. Even though I had to crawl backwards to do it, those steep, jagged stairs were made of something slick and cold as ice. A black wind blew around us as we crawled downwards. It felt like being on the edge of a mountain peak, even though I knew that was impossible. We were still indoors, weren't we? Or maybe, on the other hand, we hadn't been in that cheap haunted house for a long time. Just maybe, we'd been swallowed by someplace else. Before long, the stairs were so tall and narrow that it was almost like being on a ladder above empty space. I was so tense that I started shaking, and I guess it's no surprise that I slipped. I slid downward, unable to grip the narrow steps and knowing that at any second I might fall into the nothingness on either side. But Cassie caught me. It happened exactly as I'd envisioned it earlier that night just like the yelling that we'd heard on the gramophone. So what about the mannequin? The one that had looked like Cassie, long dead and falling through empty space. Clinging to the almost vertical steps, I shouted my friend's name, even though I knew that it was already too late. By grabbing me, she'd unbalanced herself and gone over the edge. She probably didn't even have time to scream. Cassie had been so sure that the stairs were our way out, but what if they had been a trap all along? After all, we hadn't opened the door to the darkness, the house had. I climbed back up the stars as quickly as I dared, and found the hallway above exactly as I'd left it well, not exactly. There was an end to it on either side, and there were sounds. Cars driving by outside, the hum of a heating system, and the teenager who'd taken our tickets, yelling about how I wasn't supposed to be back there, and anyway, the haunted house was closed. Of course, I filed a police report. A lot of good that did. When I told them what had happened, they decided my friends and I were junkies on a bad trip. Later, they kicked around the idea that we were in some kind of satanic cult, and that I'd killed them myself. In the end, I guess they just decided that the whole thing was too complicated and strange to bother with. Tyler's family moved away without a word to anyone, and Cassie's dad drank himself to death before Christmas. The neighbors said that at night he would scream out her name, like he didn't know she was gone. I stayed where I was and did my best to forget about the whole thing. As you can see, it hasn't worked out. The sun had set while Frank had told me his story and in the twilight gloom he looked almost like a ghost himself. I didn't know what to say. I mumbled something about how it was getting cold on the porch and headed for the screen door. I'm not asking you to believe everything you hear, Frank smiled. Just promise me that, as long as you live under my roof, you'll stay away from haunted houses. I nodded, and Frank pulled himself up from his rocking chair to follow me inside for supper. That's when I noticed the scar on his ankle, a scar in the shape of a small, six-fingered hand. Fourth story, the Wendigo at the edge of the lights. The engine stutters as I turn the key, but it dies a few seconds after. Damn it, her engine's cold, it might take a minute to get it running. Frickin' blizzards, I can't wait till winter's over. I say turning the key more, well hurry up it's freezing. Claire says zipping up her hoodie. I turn the key two more times and Shelly shoots to life. Her lights flicker on and I hear Claire gasp. I look up and see a figure, just standing on the edge of my headlights. I can make out antlers like a deer but it's on two legs. 
I push my door open and pull out my 9mm loaded with silver bullets, rack the slide, and aim it at the figure, knowing it's what I am hunting. As I do I hear Claire get out and pull back the hammer of her .38 revolver. Javier. I say pushing the truck release button. Javier wakes up and sees what's going on and starts to open the door slowly stepping out. That's not a werewolf, Aiden. Claire says with some unease in her voice. Me and Javier start going back to the truck, while not taking our eyes off the creature who is just standing there, watching us. We get to the back and open it up and lift the bottom panel revealing a bunch of guns, ammo and other things I've collected over the years. I grab the flamethrower I made a few months ago for fun, and recently used to take out some out of sprig gone that was stuck in Minnesota, and put the sling over me letting it hang. I handed Javier his double barrel shut the trunk, and walked back to my door keeping my Beretta aimed as I walked back. We stayed like this for a while, then the creature started sprinting at us moving way too fast for a werewolf. I fired two rounds the first hitting the creature in the shoulder, and the second hitting its upper chest but the creature didn't stop rushing us. Within just a few seconds the distance was closed and it pounced on me before I could get another shot off, pushing me into the snow, digging its claws into my shoulders. The creature was inches away from me, its skin on its face seemingly peeled back, reveling a deer skull with teeth, more like a wolf not deer teeth. It's skin leathery with a coat of dark gray tangled and matted hair with blood scattered about, some dried and some wet. At this point I knew exactly what this was, a wendigo. As I was struggling to get the thing off I saw a bullet collied with the thing's back as Claire's revolver rang out. The wendigo looked at her and brought its claw up and swung down fast pushing her over. Javier slides across the hood and fires a shot at the thing but misses, sending Buck shot flying over it. The Wendigo shoots its head to Claire who is still getting up and jumps onto her leaving me. I stand up and turn to Javier who is visibly upset he missed. Shoddy. I shout. He tosses me the gun and I run up and blast a hole into the Wendigo's back, making it really upset. He turns to me and lets out a scream. I brace myself. The wendigo hits me sending back into the snow which helps my fall but the claws left a nice gash in my chest. I look over and see Javier got his fire axe out of the trunk and was swinging at the wendigo, who was preoccupied with Claire. He dug the axe into the wendigo's shoulder putting a nice cut into it. The Wendigo screams and walks a few feet then collapses onto the snow-covered road. Burn it now. Claire says to me running over to it with Javier. Javier takes his axe out of it and raises it up then swings back down hitting its neck and chopping its head off. He bends over and picks up the head by the antlers. A nice trophy, right Aiden? As he shows me Claire grabs it and starts trying to pull it from his hands... No, we have to burn it. She says getting in a tug of war battle with a six feet three inches dude who is jacked and actually almost won. I get up and run over helping Claire pull the head and thankfully we got it free. Before we can say anything she pulls out a pocket knife and cuts the antlers out and shoves them into her pack. Hey, I want those. Javier says crossing his arms. She shrugs and gets back into the car. I flick on the Zippo light that is on the end of the flamethrower and begin to torch the body which lets off an awful smell, but I've smelt worse. Javier hits me right where the Wendigo ripped into my shoulder and says, good work buddy, as he giggles a little knowing that hurt. I smile and shake my head then run to the trunk to put my flamethrower back and get into the car with Claire. I stick out my fist and she hesitantly bumps it. Nice. I say turning around and putting my seatbelt on. Javier comes around putting his shotgun up and closes the trunk then comes and get in on the passenger side. We should probably go to the hospital. You're pretty beat up Aiden. Claire says eyeing my wounds. I hate hospital. I say putting the car into drive. Aiden. She says unamused. Fine.
I push down the gas pedal and Shelly works her way out of the snow and starts moving towards town, leaving the flaming body behind. Fifth story. The 911 call that haunts me. We all have those calls that haunt us. There's not a 911 dispatcher alive who doesn't have at least one that sticks with them for the rest of their lives. Hell, most have too many to count. I always thought I was above that. I'd never let this job or those calls get to me. I was tough. But then September 12th happened. I worked the night shift in a very rural county sheriff's office. A little over 1,200 square miles and with a population of 31,000, not a lot in the way of heinous crimes happened. There were those out of the ordinary UFO calls every now and then, but most of the time it was loose cows and cars slash deer accidents. We sure do have our share of crazies, and that night, my caller was one of them. It was about 3.01 in the morning, my partner Anna and I were watching reruns of 90 Day Fiancé when the 911 call tones went off. Totally routine. I try to answer the phones faster than Anna because she has the quickest hands in the West when it comes to call taking and unfortunately this time, I got it. County 911. What's the address of your emergency? Silence. Hello, County 911. More silence. I look to my call screen where the coordinates are. Updating the call, it finally phases to the correct coordinates to map roughly where the caller is. Hello, County 911, what's your emergency? I repeat again, entering the coordinates in. It maps to a residence in our second largest city, and immediately I know who our caller is. Marjorie Cannonberry. Don't let her name fool you, she's not a sweet old lady but rather a 32-year-old drug user. Extensive history in our in-house records, and I don't even need to look her up. In my three years of dispatching here, I can't recall just one week where I didn't have a call with Marjorie. Hello, Marge. Do you have an emergency? I ask again. We're on first-name basis. Yes. I finally hear her whisper. Okay. What's going on? There's, she pauses, her breathing trembling slightly. There's something in my closet. There's someone in your closet? I asked, quickly typing into my call narrative. How do you know they're there? Did you see them? No, not someone. She whispered again. I could tell she was truly terrified. Something. I don't know what it is. Okay. At this point, I'm convinced Marge is having another drug-induced hallucination. It wouldn't be the first time. Describe for me what it looks like. In the background, Anna is dispatching our area deputy. Please send someone. Marge whispered. Yes, I have a deputy on the way, Marge. But I need you to tell me what you're seeing. I said, when you said something, what did you mean? It's tall. She said... It has to bend over to fit, and it has long claws. She paused, and I could hear her sniffling. She was definitely crying. It's tapping them on the floor. Can you hear them? She paused, and I listened carefully to see if I could actually hear anything. Maybe it was my imagination, but I thought, just barely, I could hear a rhythmic tapping. Did you hear them? She asked, almost desperately, like she was begging me to believe her. I ignored her question. What else, Marge? What else do you see? Um, her voice trembled. It's all black, and it has really big teeth. It keeps licking its teeth like it wants to eat me. So it knows you're there? Yes, she said shakily. It's staring right at me, glowing yellow eyes. For the first time in my life, a shiver went down my spine from her words. Every horror movie I've ever seen came to mind. Though I knew better, my supernatural bone was peaked. Could there really be a demon in her closet? Are you able to leave the room, Marge? I asked, typing all of this into our dispatch narrative. Can you go outside until my deputy gets there to see what's in there? 
I don't think so, she sobbed. If I move, it'll kill me. Have you been drinking tonight, Marjorie? I know how incriminating it sounded, but it was a legitimate clarifying question. Call me heartless if you want. No, she sobbed again. Please believe me. I know I've done stupid things before, but this is real. I haven't been drinking, and I haven't taken any drugs recently. I don't know what it is, but I'm so scared. It keeps tapping its claws. You have to hear them, don't you? The phone cracked as she held it out at arm's length. There was no mistaking this time. I could hear something tapping. A pit formed in my stomach. What the fuck? It was like the sound of long acrylic fingernails. Okay, Marge, I'm going to stay on the phone with you until my deputy gets there. I looked to our mapping software. He's not super far out, so it shouldn't be too much longer. Okay, thank you. She whispered, it's just staring at me. Does it have a face? I ask, against my better judgment. Did I actually believe there was something there? Yeah, but it's all teeth. Like it's smiling. And it hasn't moved since you saw it? No, it's just there. Staring and tapping its claws. How long has it been there? I don't know. I woke up to the tapping noise and just saw it there. So I called you right away. Marge said, You don't believe me, do you? It's not that I don't believe you, Marge, I answered. I've just never heard of this sort of thing before. What you're describing sounds like a demon from a horror film. I think it is. Another shiver. Her voice sounded so convinced. Real or not, she was legitimately seeing something. Whether it was an actual demon or a hallucination, part of me felt bad for her. Being absolutely convinced something like what she described was staring at her, it would be terrifying. Marge suddenly gasped and the phone rustled as it fell from her hands. What's going on, Marge? I asked quickly, my tone dropping in seriousness. It's coming toward me. She screamed, Oh God, it's claws. Please help me. My deputy is almost there, Marge. I said loudly, over her screams, but I doubt she heard me. If I hadn't been freaked out by then, I was now. Those blood-curdling screams were ones of pure and unfiltered terror. It was like I was listening to someone whose life was coming to an end in the most violent way possible. My pulse was flying as I was trying to type everything I heard into the call. Next to me, Anna was relaying the info to our deputy. Come on, I though, get there already. The problem with the rural county was that we didn't have as many deputies on as others, so our response time was significantly longer. This particular night, that city's officer had called in sick, so it was the county's job to cover if there were any calls. 1303 be advised. She's screaming and not answering us anymore. Tasha said to our responding deputy. 1303 10 to 4, 2 minutes out. 1308 to dispatch. I'll be 10 to 76 as well. Our other unit in the area piped up. I had seen him making his way towards the area before, but now he was going emergent. I repeatedly tried to get Marge to come back on the phone, but all I could hear were her screams. I could also hear things being thrown around, like she was smashing into them with her body. And suddenly, as quick as it had happened, everything went silent. Marge! I shouted, Marge are you there? The phone crackled. He's going to kill me. Marge said monotonously, he knows who you are now, you're next. And then the line went dead. If I had a handset phone, it would have fallen out of my hand. How would anyone not get unnerved by something like that? The movie lover in me was terrified. You're next. 1303 dispatch. I'm 10 to 23. The first responding deputy advised he was on scene. His name was Jason, our youngest deputy on the department. A super nice kid who was probably the best person that could respond to help March. 
Anna held radio traffic just for that call. And we waited for what seemed like an eternity as Jason went into the house. 1303 dispatch. It nearly made me jump out of my seat. My nerves on end. Get a med rolling. She's cut up her arms pretty bad. Within five minutes, our med unit was rolling. Jason and Trevor, his backup, ended up chaptering Marge. They came up before Jason transferred her to the mental hospital after getting medical clearance and explained everything that happened. Apparently Marge was tripping out on drugs, my first suspicion, and decided to cut her arms with razor blades. She'd also trashed her apartment in her drug stupor, which would explain the crashing around I heard. But what about the tapping? I asked. I heard the tapping she was talking about. I don't know anything about that, Jason said with a shrug. But it was probably something she was doing that she didn't realize she was doing. Yeah, you're probably right, I said, but I still couldn't shake the bad feeling. It's sad, honestly, Jason said, retrieving the papers off of the printer that he was printing. She's so fried from drugs she's just crazy now. I glanced out the dispatch window to the lobby, where Trevor was sitting with Marge. She sat with her head hanging down and her arms in bandages. Seeing someone hopped up on drugs was always a little disturbing to me. As if she knew I was looking at her, she lifted her head and her eyes met mine. They grew wide, as if she was about to be hit by a bus, and she pointed at me letting out another piercing cry. Trevor stood up as she did, putting himself between her and me inadvertently. I couldn't shake the feeling that she wasn't pointing at me, but rather, behind me. I told myself it was dumb, but why was it I couldn't look over my shoulder? Jason flew out the door with the paperwork he needed, and both struggled down to the front with her, to load her up in the squad. In two days, Hospital staff would find Marge dead in her room, her head somehow twisted unnaturally around. Her death would never have a full explanation. Finally, after taking a deep breath, I turned around. There was nothing there. I let out a breath that I didn't know I was holding, and then laughed at myself. Of course there was nothing there. The rest of the shift went by smoothly, the whole twenty minutes we had left. When we finally left that night, I couldn't wait to go home and go to bed. That call had really rattled me and left me with a headache. I got back to my little apartment, greeted by my little white cat. After giving her more food, I took off my uniform and hung it up in the closet, making sure to close the doors. Hurrying back to my bed, I jumped in and turned the TV on for background noise. That night, I slept with the lights on. Maybe it was just my imagination running wild, or the stress of a long week, but as I closed the door to my closet, I could have sworn there was a pair of glowing yellow eyes staring back at me.